Welcome to Courageous and Just Conversations on Faith in Challenging Times. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary in New York, and I am also theologian in residence at Trinity Church Wall Street in New York. I am pleased to be here today with Austin Channing Brown, author of I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness. Welcome, Austin, and thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So I want to begin by asking you, why this book? Mm -hmm. What made you write this book? Mm -hmm. I grew up in predominantly white spaces, and so hanging out with a whole lot of white folks was not mm -hmm. new to me. <laughs> but I discovered that there was a big difference between being educated around white folks and working with white mm. folks. And I don't know that I was prepared for that difference. And so when I entered the workforce and found myself losing myself, someone who was a proud black woman, who loved diversity, right? And to realize that I could lose myself is the reason I wrote this book. But tell me, what's that difference yeah. between growing up and going to school in white spaces right. and so you learn how to navigate right. that space? You think, I think until you get in the workplace. Uh -huh. What's the difference? So I think in school, largely whiteness was my peers. So there was no power difference between us, mm. right? But when I got into the workforce, I wasn't prepared for the ways that my benefits, my wages would be tied to my ability or my desire mm -hmm. to assimilate or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that was a big difference for me. Well, there's so much there just in what you've just said that I want to pick apart a little bit. Yes. And especially given some of the things that you related in your book about mm -hmm. being in a white space uh, in school. But the first thing I want to pick apart is what do you mean by whiteness? Yes. Um, by whiteness, I mean, um, how white folks often believe that the way they think, the way they behave, their values, their attitudes are always right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that their experiences are universal. But let's go back a little bit and where you talk about sort of this uh, discovery of whiteness and uh, not having to simulate yet in high school, uh, in yes. elementary school, rather. Yes. It seems that that was I don't know if it was the first time, but it marked the time when you were called the N word. That's right. It was the first time I was like third or fourth grade, I believe. And I had been attended the same school since I was in preschool. Mm -hmm. So I knew my school better than a lot of teachers knew my school. Okay, I, I owned that school as far as I was concerned. And so to have one of my classmates, who I assume I had known for maybe three or four years at that point, um, stand in line and out of nowhere call me the N-word, I was not ready. I was not ready. I didn't see it coming. We weren't having a fight, you know, like it just came out of the blue. They were very aware of your blackness. Tell me this, when was the first time that you became aware of that aha moment like, oh, okay, I'm black. When was your awareness of your blackness and what did that mean to you? So I was aware pretty early about the racial difference, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I fully appreciated what the world thought about blackness right. until I was called the N-word and then when my mother told me about my name. Mm. Tell me, tell us about that. Yeah, um, we went to the, the library all the time mm -hmm. and um, I walked up into the library and went to check out some books and I handed the librarian my card and she said, is this your library card? I said, I think so. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's my library card. And she said, this card says Austin. And I said, oh yeah, that's my card. I'm, that's me. And it made me really upset. And so I marched over to my mother and I said, Ma, why did you name me Austin? And she started to tell me about my family history and where my name comes from. I was like, Mama, I already know all of that. I said, why did you choose it? And so she sat me down and she said to me, Austin, one day you're gonna have to apply for jobs. Yeah. And we knew that if your application said Austin, people would assume you're a white man. 
And then she finished by saying, we just had to make sure you got to the interview. What's the, you know, the impact yeah. uh, of that on you as you're growing up and, and just trying to come into your own as a person. And then here you are in this black body and you have to also take in that, you know, I need to be aware of who I am and how I navigate reality. Like I can't put my hands in my pocket, et cetera. So tell me about the impact of that. Yeah, I feel like there's been a lot of talk lately um, about the talk, right. right? That black right. parents have with their kids. And I think largely that black parents are having with their sons. Right. right. My parents never had the talk mm -hmm. with me. It was always learning as we went. Mm -hmm. So I would buy a CD in a store and just like ignore the receipt and walk out and like tear open my mm -hmm. little CD, right? And my mom in that moment would say, no daughter, you don't ever get rid of your receipt mm -hmm. until you are out into the like parking lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it was like these moments right. where I just had to stop where life was just happening. Mm -hmm. And my moment and my parents would insert this little lesson mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then move on. Mm -hmm. But it made me highly aware that at any point when I wasn't paying attention, when I was just being a human, just living my life, right? right that whiteness could assume something dangerous about me or insidious about me because I wasn't paying attention. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, and it's one of the things as you talk about whiteness, it's one of the things that whiteness or white people don't understand, right. you know, sort of that other layer of what it means. Uh, Audre Lorde says that we have to teach our children to love and resist at the same time. And I am struck in your book uh, where you say, in spite of it all, that's right. I wouldn't be anything else but a black girl. Tell me about that moment when you come to yourself oh, and say, you know goodness. what? Even though they treat me like this, That's right. I like being black. That's right. Well, I think one thing that black parents do really well and we have to work really hard at mm -hmm. is to say that anti-blackness is the world's problem, uh, yes. right? Yes. Not yes. our problem. It doesn't right. mean that there's something wrong with you, right? right? right. It's something wrong with the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I feel like my parents were doing that simultaneously, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. at the dinner table, I was learning about Rosa Parks and Martin right. Luther King Jr. And we were playing Michael Jackson and Whitney <laughs> Houston. And you know, like we loved blackness and mm -hmm. black culture. Um, and to a certain degree, I would say we were prideful about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Let's jump ahead to this experience now that you are having in the workplace. Yes. And you talked about that uh, in our conversation just now as sort of these performance reviews and, and, not, and finding out that you, know, you had to assimilate and th what it meant not to assimilate. Yeah. But what about the everyday experiences? You know, I'm always amazed the, the quote unquote microaggressions. And I would say the only people for whom those are microaggressions are the people who aggress. So I think, I think yes and no, right? Mm -hmm. I think it depended on the microaggression. Mm -hmm. so in some part because of the rules of Christianity and politeness, mm -hmm. right? And so oh, we'll if get I- get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. So when I think about um, someone touching my hair, yes. right? Who means to be um, kind and is trying to give a compliment, right? But I am not experiencing this as a compliment. This is an intimate act. Right, right. <laughs> I don't know you that well. Right. Can we talk about consent? Right? But the rules of Christianity and politeness say that I can't get angry mm -hmm. and that I can't. Right. Right? <laughs> that I must hide my offense. Um, and so in some ways, I was like, what do I do? You know? And then there were other moments when I thought, Nope, I'm not going to give in to the craziness of this moment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So when a white person mistakes me for the only other black woman in the office, right? right? You talk about the politeness of Christianity that does not allow you to get angry. Right. And I will return to that, but what about the values or the mm -hmm. assumptions or, of, of white culture or yes. of whiteness yes. that doesn't allow you as a black woman to get angry? Oh. It's, it, whiteness is in many ways so insidious because it expects assimilation, mm -hmm. um, because it's not asking, right? It's not offering a choice. The expectation that is you will desire to be like it. 
Mm -hmm. And that is so insidious. Um, so I remember, um, I remember one workplace, um, my supervisor telling me how much leadership potential I had. Every, every time I was in her office, you have so much potential. You are just, oh, right? And then the first time I would be like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so glad you recognize my leadership potential, right? And it took me such a long time to realize what she meant was right. not, Austin, I see who you could become, right. but Austin, I see potential for you to be like us. Right. Right. I see right. potential for you to teach like us. Right. I see potential for you to speak like us. I see potential for you to take on a certain personality like us. Right? right? That's what she meant. Right. So is it something, you know, about whiteness? I'm, I'm, you know, exploring and navigating this thing, you know, is it possible mm -hmm. to be white and Christian even if we accept the fact that, as I often say, just because you happen to look like a white American right. doesn't mean you have to act like one. That's right. So That's right. that is it possible? Yeah. to uh, be both white and Christian uh, in that sense of whiteness yeah. as you've explained it, or is that an anathema? Uh, yeah, I think that whiteness as a structure, as a power structure, mm -hmm. and as an understanding of oneself has to be cast off. Mm -hmm. And I think that's possible. Yeah. I think as a daily practice, mm -hmm. right? right? Not as a right. one time, like, right. oh, I'm not right. white anymore, right? But as a, as a daily decision, mm -hmm. okay. right? Um, that I am going to do my best to not participate mm -hmm. in whiteness. Um, I think that's possible mm -hmm. to be Christian and do that. <laughs> no, no, good. It, it reminds me of uh, uh, one uh, feminist and uh, who's uh, obviously a white feminist once said that the most that white people can ever uh, be, and, and I think it's a good thing, mm -hmm. are recovering racists. So I that every day agree. they have to uh, be very self-aware right. of the ways in which they are or are not choosing to uh, live That's in right. to That's this right. reality of whiteness. I think it requires a certain level of vigilance. What's the role? What do, you, what do you think the role of the church should be, particularly the white church in this regard? Is there a possibility for telling the truth? And what's the role of the church in that? There is a possibility for telling the truth. I think the question is, is it desired? Mm. Is there a desire to tell the truth? And I think there are so many churches who don't want to talk about uh, white flight mm -hmm. and who don't want to talk about their own participation in slavery mm -hmm. and don't want to talk about um, who preached for segregation from that pulpit mm -hmm. and don't want to talk about how they decided to put their church in that particular location. Mm -hmm. And right, 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 who don't right. want to talk about their funders, their donors, who are often more conservative, even if the leadership right. would like to be more progressive, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. um, so do I think it's possible? I have to believe that it's possible. <laughs> so in my white Christian education <laughs> spaces, we had a chapel service every Friday. So I was not um, unaware of how uh, white culture, at least in that particular context, mm -hmm. prayed and gave sermons and understood the Bible. And, right? Right. Um, and it often boiled down to here's what to do and here's what not to do. Then I walk into a black church <laughs> and that pastor got up. And first of all, was such a beautiful storyteller mm -hmm. and translating what that story meant in ancient times mm -hmm. to how that applied to the hood. Right. So often it was more about who we were hmm. and saying, you know what? I realize that you're an addict, but God can still transform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I realize that you're broke, but God can figure out how to pay that bill. And I realize that your kids are on the street, but God's not done with them yet. Right, like it was right. about who right. we were as a people and as a community and not just a checklist for being good. Mm -hmm. You know, our beloved black church <laughs> is good on these issues of uh -huh. race, but not so good on these issues of gender and sexual identity and gendered identities. Oh, I was able to, to grow up, literally grow up under mm -hmm. a pastor who had no qualms about women in ministry. 
I mean, it wasn't until I was in college, actually, that I even explored, why do people think women can't be ministers? Because I didn't know. Um, so I was really blessed in that regard. Um, but I was also highly aware that not every church was like that. So I knew that there were plenty of black churches that were right. not doing great on almost any <laughs> other social right. issue right. Right. other than race and poverty. Right. 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 Um, and so, um, yeah, so in that regard, the black church is not immune from dysfunction. Right. and is creating different rules for itself in blackness mm -hmm. than it would, like there are rules that it would never tolerate. Mm -hmm. for so what does the black mm -hmm. Jesus, the black Christ have to say yeah. to the black church then in those moments Ooh, of uh, mm -hmm. heterosexism yes. and sexism? Yes, I think, um, I think our Jesus would say, um, you've got to stop limiting me. Mm -hmm. Just as I asked, what's the role of the white church in yes. this, particularly in this moment in which we find ourselves, what do you believe the role of the black church is yeah. in this, this make America great again moment in which we find ourselves? Yeah. Um, and then I want to follow up I with another hope, question. Yeah. I hope that the black church would continue to be prophetic mm. as it has always been. Um, because I think the majority of my hope is rooted in the fact that the black church has never accepted things as they are. Didn't accept slavery, didn't accept black codes, didn't now, it may have taken us a second to overturn it, right? right? But at no point was there a level of acceptance mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. where we were. And I hope that that will continue to be the case. So what's justice look like? Man, I think justice looks like reparations. I think justice looks like equity. I think, and I, th I think that's true on both a structural level. I think we have to do some talking about the criminal justice system and all the folks we have locked up for marijuana, which is now legal in a number of states, including Michigan, my own, um, right? So I think as we talk about like reparations and equity, I think there are very particular institutions we could look at. Mm -hmm. But I think, um, I think the truth is where I spend most of my actual time um, in particular buildings, right? Church buildings, um, university campuses. Um, I think those institutions have a lot to discuss in terms of what it looks like to um, have equitable, equitable pay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what it looks like to pay professors of color for the extra work that they're doing with students of color. What it looks like to have a legacy student for uh, institution that once upon a time didn't allow black folks to be a part of the institution. Right, right. That does not seem just. <laughs> right. so, so, so tell me this, you know, when you look at what could be a just future, and I know you have a one-year-old son. So what does that, what future, what, what does a just future look like for your son? What is the just future that you want for your son? I don't believe that he'll have one. Mm. And I don't anticipate that in the next 20 years that he is going to experience anything that's vastly different than what my husband and I have experienced. Hmm. And so I have to prepare him for a world of injustice and hope that I can instill in him a desire to seek justice because I don't believe that the world is gonna change enough for him to actually experience justice. So now that sounds like another book. <laughs> Do you because, think so? Yeah, because <laughs> what does it feel, that's, you know, what does it feel like knowing that you are preparing your son to navigate his life yeah. through an unjust world, you know? I think every, every night still, yes. I wait for that text from my son yes. to let me know that he's in safe, right? Because you know, I always say to him, I, it's not what, I don't worry about you, I worry about them. Yes. So yes. what does it feel like? Right now, it feels unfair. <laughs> it feels unfair. Um, when, um, when I was on my way to the hospital to deliver, um, my husband and I were in the car and we weren't talking about names and we weren't talking about um, how our lives were about to change. 
we were talking about what we would do if the doctors didn't believe me if I was in a particular amount of pain <laughs> or if something had gone wrong um, and they weren't taking it seriously. So Which even, is the reality of so many black women, right? And, right. <laughs> and so in some ways, even as I'm giving birth to him, I am thinking about the injustice of blackness, right, in this country. And um, I think to be a responsible parent, I must prepare him for that world. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that I can't also dance with him to Stevie Wonder. <laughs> right. Right? Well, but that's preparing him for the world, that's right? Preparing him because for the world. it's loving yes. and resisting yes. at the same time. At the same time. So I want to I want to leave you with this question, you know, and it's a twofold question. Sure. Who was your book written for? Yes. I mean, I enjoyed it, yes. but who was it written for? And what do you want people to take away when they close mm. that book? Wow. So I wrote this book very specifically for black women. Very specifically. I want two things for black women. I one want black women to know that they are seen and they are heard and to be affirmed in their own experience. And I want black women to now have a tool to not have to do the emotional labor of teaching someone else about their experience. I want them to close the book and be like, this was so my story too that I'm gonna hand this to all my white coworkers <laughs> so that I don't have to cut myself open and show them that I'm bleeding.